Father, we welcome you here this morning. 
Father, send your Holy Spirit to dwell here among us. Father, to have your way among us. Father, those coming with need, Father, meet them today. Father, those coming with a challenge, Father, answer that challenge today. Father, we thank you for your presence here with us now and are really excited at all that you are going to do and show us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, you'll notice if you look down the back, we've got Russell on the desk, which is good because our, all our sound guys are away in Christchurch. So um, Gary and Jared and Jason are all down at Promise Keepers. So that's where they're away today. Um, and we are praying with today's weather that they will have really safe journeys home with us. There's a lot of snow forecast. So, um, yep, our prayers are with them as they travel today. We also don't have any musicians today, so today's service is going to be all YouTube music. So we're going to be blessed by others from around New Zealand that have provided beautiful music with us today. So our first, um, it's not our first song, it's a group of songs that I've chosen this morning. And... I don't know about you, but for me, when I say things to God out loud, it seems to make a difference than if I just whisper them in my head. And so this morning, we're going to sing these songs. We're going to sing them out loud. They are going to talk about who God is, what God has done for us, and they worship, they give him honor, they give him glory, and that is what he deserves and that is what he desires from us. And when we draw close to God in praise, acknowledging who he is, he draws closer to us. And when he draws closer to us, we hear him. And we hear him in you and wonderful ways. So let's worship this morning and see what it is that God's got to say to you today. Please stand. <laughs>
for you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. There is no one, no one like you. Father, come. Send your Holy Spirit to continue with us. May we be open, open to hear your voice this morning, to hear what your Spirit has to tell us. Father, give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see. Father, give us hearts obedient to you today. Amen. Would you like to be seated? We've got a time in our service now that um, we call testimonies and um, it's a chance for anyone to share what is it God's been doing with you, for you, in you.
reflect on who God is and gives us opportunity to worship him. So you might like to stand and join me.
Jennifer, I might take you up on that offer of just sitting in there while we go through and we'll try this. No, it works. Um, it works. No, it works. At the end of the, you just need to sit there. Just so when I come to preach, just change over. It says sermon eighth of August. So this is the reading to start with. Father God, may the words that I speak, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Just to let Anna know that light will be quite bright. So it's just a video light we need it for. Uh, it's a, what's called a key light, but there we go. So here we go. As I mentioned last week, uh, when we were looking at what we're going to do for the next uh, quarter, uh, God didn't want me to share the book of Romans. He said, we, need, we don't need more knowledge. We need to know the journey. And so he led me to the book of Acts. And then, uh, as was uh, uh, pointed out to me, my goodness, one of the readings we have is 42 verses long. And God had clearly said to me, I want my people to hear my word, not your opinion. I shared that with some of my pastor friends during the week. And they said, well said, that we need more of God's word than somebody's opinion. And so here we go this morning. Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to do it from here because I do have a clicker. Okay, but you be my safety net. Thank you, my dear. Right. So I'm going to read it, but I invite you to read along with me as we go through Acts 2, 1 to 41. So here we go. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native tongue, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygeria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of the Libya belong to Cyrene, 
and visitors from Rome. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in, a, in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch, patriarch David that he both died and was buried. And his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God swore with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus Christ raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know, for creation that God has no, for certain, sorry, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus Christ whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. 
For those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Amen and amen. Father God, the words that I speak, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Jennifer, beside you to your left, you will find a script. That's the one. There we go. I'll have a go from here. I'll leave it to you, actually. So here we go. This is going to be more teaching than opinion. When we hear the word Pentecost, in church circles anyway, we often think of either the denominational style called Pentecostalism, or we think of a celebration in our church calendar. Now, Pentecostalism was born in around 1903, 1904, 1905, somewhere around there, uh, at a little church in Los Angeles um, called Azusa Street, where they describe that as the birth of Pentecostalism, as the spirit-filled gathering of people uh, started celebrating church in quite a different and profoundly spirit-filled way. The normal celebrating that we have uh, here uh, through, especially um, uh, through uh, the Anglican calendar, is the coming of the Holy Spirit, and it's one Sunday um, uh, after Easter, about uh, five weeks after Easter, five, seven weeks after Easter, Neil? He says, look, seven weeks after. Um, so, uh, so it may seem that Pentecost uh, and what we celebrate is actually a Christian festival. Well, yes it is, but originally it wasn't. So as we go into the history, I'm hoping you'll under be able to understand the, uh, the rich nature of Pentecost of the meaning that it has, and also to be able to see the incredible magnitude of God's love letter to his people here today that is based out of history from thousands upon thousands of years ago. That the, 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 reference, the, the book we have, the instruction manual we have called the Bible, is inter interlinked all the way through and that a whole lot of the stuff that we've just heard about in the reading um, uh, before us this morning would have been well known and understood by the people of the day but the nuance and the subtlety of the detail is missed to us today so here we go in judaism the festival of weeks the shavat is a harvest festival and it's celebrated seven weeks and one day after the day of Passover, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we remember that Jesus was crucified during Passover. Yeah. I actually haven't got this here. We understand Passover. Passover was uh, when the Jews were about to leave Egypt and they were instructed to take an unblemished lamb and to paint the blood of that lamb on the lentil, uh, on the doorposts of their homes so that this, the angel of death would pass over them and that they would be safe, that the firstborn of all who weren't of the faith would die that night, including Pharaoh's son died that night. So that's where the Passover comes from, and the Passover lamb was an unblemished lamb as Jesus Christ was our unblemished sacrifice. And then the blood that he spilt has enabled the passing over of God's judgment on all who believe in him. Does this make sense? The, the, they would have understood all of this in those days. So it was seven weeks and one day after Passover. And it's mentioned in Deuteronomy 
that it's seven weeks and one day after the Sabbath that is referred to in Leviticus 23.16, that the festival of... Uh, it's the next slide, Jennifer. Um, the uh, the um, Deuteronomy 16 is seven weeks and one day after the Sabbath referred to in Leviticus as the festival of weeks. It is also called the Feast of Harvest. And in Exodus 23, 16, it's the day of the first fruits. That the Feast of the Harvest is also referred to as the day of the first fruits. And in Numbers 28, 26, sorry, in Exodus 34, 22, in Exodus 34, 22, it's called the first fruits of the wheat harvest. The date for the festival of weeks originally came the day after seven full weeks following the first harvest of grain. Now the people of Jerusalem would have known this information. They would have understood that the day that all this is happening is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. In Jewish tradition, the 50th day was known as the Festival of Weeks. It's important to note that the people of the time would have known the information where today we don't understand it and we certainly don't gather the profound nature of what was happening on this day in this place with these people. So during the Hellenistic period, that's around 323 BC to uh, about 30 years before Jesus was born, the ancient harvest festival also became a day of renewing the Noahic covenant. So that's the covenant with Noah. And it's described in Genesis 9, 8 to 17, which is established between God and all flesh that is upon the earth. When the flood dissipated, God created a covenant with Noah where he was going to bless all flesh that is upon the earth. And again, the people of uh, the time would have known these things. So when the prophet Joel is talking about the Spirit being poured out on all flesh, they would have connected the things together and understood that this is a move of God. So here we are, seven weeks and one day after what was to us the day of crucifixion but to the Jews was the day of Passover but why would God do it then does God maybe see those giving their lives to Christ on that day are the first fruits of the new harvest The verb that's used in Acts 2.1 to indicate the arrival of the day of Pentecost in the original language carries a connotation of fulfillment. So where it says it was the day of Pentecost, the connotation behind the way that those words are structured is that this is a day of fulfillment. It is as though God is declaring, and it's lost to us today unfortunately, but very much in the minds of the Jews, that this is a, res a symbolic renewing of the covenant between God and all flesh, which would take them right back to the time of Noah. Peter talks about that from the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And we remember this when we talk in the, new, in the Eucharist of the new covenant. That this is my blood poured out from the new covenant between God and his people. So the encouraging part of this chapter is the very first verse, and that is that they were still in one place. They were all together in one place. They were being obedient. And saints, we are discovering that as we are obedient to what he's doing, he shows up, and God here has shown up. The people were bewildered, were amazed. These are the words that we use. Bewildered, amazed, astonished, perplexed, and some were even mocking. 
And friends, that is typical of a move of God. That people will be bewildered, won't be able to understand it, can't get their heads around it, and others will just mock it and, and, and write it off. And we're seeing that to this very day, people who are mocking uh, the things of faith. There's another interesting uh, um, observation here, uh, and it was made uh, by Bill Johnson from Bethel Church. He said that uh, as he was reading this, he could see this as uh, the first gathering where the Holy Spirit was totally in charge of what was happening. And he wondered whether uh, it was simply because nobody thought that they knew enough at that time to be able to interfere and mess it up. And I don't know about that, but there we go. I thought it was quite funny. Uh, the impact on these people, as powerful as Peter's sermon was, must have been something out of the ordinary. And it must have been nearly instant because 3,000 people came to faith. And 3,000 coming to faith is truly significant. It was not ones or twos or tens. And I've mentioned here before that my prayer is that God will bring 50s and 100s to faith in this town because twos and threes could just be a clever preacher or a talented worship leader. But here there were 3,000 crying out, what must we do to be saved? But this also needs to be put into context. We need to understand that this wasn't something that was advertised, it wasn't planned, and it wasn't rehearsed. Or it wasn't even some eagerly awaited revival conference. I heard recently that uh, the, the church in many quarters is so hung up on waiting for Jesus to return that we forget we have a job to do in the meantime. So they weren't sitting around waiting for a revival. This was spontaneous. It was the opposite to what would have been expected in Jerusalem at the time. Jerusalem was in turmoil. Remember I mentioned it last week. The temple was devastated that things had gotten out of their control. The Romans were furious that a body had gone missing on their watch. And they weren't going to let that embarrass them. But even more amazing... And I wonder if you've ever considered this. And when I thought of this about when God dropped this into my head about a fortnight ago, it profoundly helped me understand what is going on here at Pentecost. Have we ever considered that Pentecost, that the outpouring of God's Spirit in this way, was not what the enemy expected to happen? Remember, we are reminded, in fact, we are warned by the Apostle Paul not to see what is happening as though people, leaders, drug barons, presidents, prime ministers, whoever they might be, actually have any real control. Remember, Paul warned us we are not dealing with flesh and blood. We are fighting against principalities and powers. This is not about flesh and blood. Yes, they are influenced by, but this is about principalities and powers. And when I finally got my head around that, I stopped trying to fight what people may be trying to do and started the spiritual warfare against the enemy who would have us think he doesn't exist. But he is very real and he is very defeated. So what's been happening in these scriptures uh, before us here? And what's been happening before this? Jesus was challenged by the devil. You may remember at his baptism. When he went out into the wilderness, remember the, the, the enemy said to him, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, the devil is so full of himself. and thought he had won. The enemy thought he had Jesus dead at the crucifixion. The church had played beautifully the devil's game. And finally, the one with the authority was now dead. All the enemy had to do was to wait, and the world would eventually worship him. But then, three days later, Jesus rose, 
Death was defeated. The enemy now knew he was in trouble. It couldn't have been a worse outcome. But there was more horror for the enemy to come. And what do we think that horror might have been? In Matthew 28, we read that Jesus reminded not only the disciples, but it doesn't take much of a stretch of the imagination to hear Jesus talking to the devil as well. I can tell you, the enemy would have been listening. And Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The devil was now furious. He believed that he had that authority. Remember, in Luke 4, 6, during the temptations out in the wilderness, the enemy said, to you, he said to Jesus, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Really? Who gave the devil such authority? Who gave the devil that authority? Who can tell me? We did. We gave the enemy that authority. In Genesis 1.26, God had created man and given him dominion or authority, dominion over all the earth. It was excellent. God gave us the authority. And when Adam and Eve ate the apple, they did not disobey God. Adam and Eve did not disobey God by eating the apple. When I first heard that, I've probably got people all skin rippling now, they didn't disobey God. They obeyed the enemy. They didn't disobey God. They obeyed the enemy. The enemy said to them, <laughs> surely you're not going to die. Just eat it. You'll find out how good things are. They obeyed the enemy. And by doing that, they then made the enemy their leader and not following God because they followed the enemy and what happened then was the transfer of power from them to the devil that's when the authority changed hands humanity squandered their authority for a lie and it was on the cross that the son of man marched into the enemy's camp and took back what belonged to God amen and amen and that's why the enemy is furious that's why he is trying to take as many with him as he can to this very day because he has humans still thinking that he has some sort of authority over you and he doesn't and i not only rebuke that but i call it out for the lie that it is and i can prove that the enemy is wrong because Jesus is alive. Full stop. But it gets even worse for the enemy now. Because Jesus then passed that authority on to his believers, who then passed on to the growing number of, sorry, onto his disciples, who then passed it on to the number of gro growing number of believers. And they told two friends. And they told two friends, and they told two friends. And Pentecost became 3,000 people with authority, and down the ages, billions and billions. This was the devil's worst nightmare, and it was begun right here on the day of Pentecost. The subtlety of first fruits was not lost on them. And I trust we can now understand the 
big story of scripture that is God doing over and over and over again this desire for us to walk with him and to partner with him and when we partner with him we can do all things through Christ who is in us by the power of his Holy Spirit that's Pentecost that's what we read here this morning and so my challenge this morning would be what would it take for 3,000 in this town to turn up here and give their lives to the Prince of Peace, to the King of Glory, to the Son of God. I wonder what that would take. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you have not left us nor forsaken us, that you have sent your Holy Spirit on that first day at Pentecost. You kept your promise that you would Pour out your spirit on all flesh. We thank you, Father, that from the beginning of time you have promised to walk with us. Forgive us, Father, that we were the ones who turned from you. We were the ones who squandered all that you have given us. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to renew our covenant with you. Help us to welcome you into our lives in a tangible and real way. We stand against the lie of the enemy that he has any kind of authority over us. Because we have the Son of God saying that all authority on heaven and earth belongs to him. And so we put the enemy on notice that he has no say in our lives, in our future. Help us, Lord, to walk with you, to meet with you. To share our lives with you. Lives that originally came from you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come to us today. If anyone has prayer they would like to bring, now is the time. if that's for more than just me and the Lord is saying um, my light inside you what is it is it an emergency beacon is it a searchlight is it a light that you've hidden and I guess and the challenge for me and for others here too maybe um, is what light what, what Christ's light is in you Am I an emergency light? Am I a search? Is it a search beacon within me? Or is it just a dim light?
on that uh, Passover weekend when the Lord knew that this was the last night that he would have amongst his people. He gathered his friends together around a table and knowing that they would need something in the time ahead to remember him by, to be able to uh, be confident that that the sacrifice was for them and for many. Uh, He took bread. The most humble element on the table. And he gave it eternal significance. When he said to them, this is my body that's given for you, he said, take and eat, all of you, to remember me. And after supper, he took a cup of wine. And after he had given you thanks, he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, the new promise the doorway to the very throne room of God thrown wide open by my sacrifice for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said, take and drink all of you to remember me. And so merciful God, we thank you that you send in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and wine and you fill them fullness of Jesus I ask Lord that you let that same spirit rest on each of us converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share for he whom the universe could not contain is now with us in this bread and he who redeemed us and calls each of us by name, now meets us in this cup. So friends, take this bread and wine, for in them God comes to us, so that we may come to God. Please come. God has invited you here this morning. Please come and receive from him.
we'll say together the prayer after communion. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still Anything did any notice this this morning? I miss anyone? Daryl, thank you. Right, so this Wednesday evening we're having a potluck dinner here um, out in the foyer and um, we've invited our messy church. Uh, this is, it's a, it's a potluck dinner for our messy church family but we want to invite uh, the 9 o'clock and the, Sunday and the 10 o'clock service to come and join and be part of that and use it as the connection point just to build connection and relationship and friendship with, with our messy church family. So 5.30 to 7, bring something to share. It's going to be relaxed, informal, and um, hopefully a great way just to build connection with others. Make sure we've just got a top note as well. So we've... Um, I need to mention it now because the event is only going to be about three weeks away. Uh, as uh, pastors in this town and certainly as uh, people of faith have gathered, we're trying to discover ways that we can continue to connect and, and grow our relationship with others. And when I was trying to wonder how we might be able to do that, uh, God reminded me of uh, what they do in Nelson with the blessing of the fleet. So I shared with, uh, at Pastor's Lunch last week, maybe what if we to a, were to approach the orchardists in this area and that we would um, ask them um, about blessing the blossom. Um, <laughs> and that we are going to connect with the uh, cultural groups that are here, you know, Fijians and Vanuatuans and Tongans and, and see whether they also will bring something of God into uh, this uh, time of blossom, this time of the beginning of the journey for the tree to produce fruit. And we want to go in as uh, low-key, if you like, as possible, but with the integrity of people of faith. So if you could pray for us as we bring all of this together that the orchardists would be open. We understand that two or three of the orchardists are very open to that and in fact our separate churches are going to pray or to offer to be at those orchards on the 29th of August um, in the afternoon at those places uh, and we it looks like we're going to cover just about the whole of, of the, the area here. So if you could pray as we try and pull this all together uh, it's just trying to be a Christian witness that they will be open to it that the um, the other cultural uh, um, representatives here would also uh, be open to it and of course my encouragement would be for all of us to um, I'll give more information as that comes but for all of us to also be present I know it sounds all messy, but it's very embryonic at the moment. We've just got an idea that we want to be able to reach the community in some way, and we thought blessing the blossom might be a way of doing that. Thanks, Philippa. Our final song this morning is um, Build Your Kingdom Here, because surely that is what God wants us to do. Please stand and join us.
condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted. Honour everyone in love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so may God be your comfort and your strength. God be your hope and support. God be your light and your way. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer and giver of life, remain with you now and forever. So go now to love and serve the Lord with joy in your heart and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, expectantly seek Christ and receive his blessing. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Go in the name of the risen Christ. Please join us.